Hello and welcome to Polyglot Principles. My name is Moja and this is a channel where I teach you how to learn a language like a genius by teaching you the principles of language learning. Alright, so today's video is about how to become addicted to language learning, right? How do you become a language learning addict, right? Because it probably takes you some effort to learn a language, right? Uh, there's a bit of resistance, but how do you become a language learning addict? And that is the aim, that is the particular aim of this video. Now, I usually share tips, very useful tips. My videos are usually very detailed, providing very useful information from the very beginning to the end. So to make sure that you don't miss out of en on anything, make sure you stay all the way through to the end, right? And as usual, I have a question for you, right? Uh, just, uh, why do you think, uh, how do you think practice can be made addictive? Or even a better question is, is it... Is it possible? Let's ask that. Is it possible for practice to be addictive? And if so, how can one make it addictive? Right. So please pause this video and try to see if uh, you can answer that question in the comment section below. I'd really love to see what you think. And also it's going to be fun for you to compare uh, my answer to your answer. Is it possible to have addictive practice? And if so, how can a practice be made addictive? Language learning practice, right? How can that be made addictive? All right. So now you're back after having written in the comment section. Let's let, let, let's dig in deep here, right? So I have a lot of interesting stuff for you today. Um, so look, in order to master a language, right? So there's various levels you can attain in a language. You could become, uh, you could you could you could be at the intermediate level. You could you could want to be at a level where okay, you could talk about basic stuff like the weather and your birthday. Or you want to, you might want to be at a level where you can talk, I don't know, a little more comfortably about a few more complex topics. Or you might be ambitious, you know, like myself, and you want to get to native-like fluency in your languages, right? So, but whatever you try to do in language learning, right, there's certain things that you need to follow, right? So, basically, to become, to achieve your language goal, whatever it is, in order to master a language, it is very important. The first factor that's really important is that you perform principled practice. What do I mean by principled practice? Principled practice is just practice that follows the principles of language learning, right? So here on the channel Polyglot Principles, I teach you the principles of language learning. And if your practice follows the principles of language learning, then you'll get results. Obviously, if your practice does not follow the principles of language learning, you're not going to get any results, right? So, I mean, what's a simple example of uh, principled practice? For example, let's say your goal is to become fluent at a language, okay? You want to become, um, let's say your goal is to speak fluently, but you spend thousands of hours listening to the language but never never speaking. Obviously, you're not performing principled practice, right? Because the principle says that, the language, language learning principle says that if you want to speak fluently, you have to speak as much as possible. That's one of the basics. You want to speak a lot, right? This will help you to speak fluently, right? So obviously, if someone is practicing only by listening, they're not following the principles of language learning. And so they're not going to get the result, right? Th so this is an example of someone who's not for doing principled practice. The first thing is, if you want to become fluent, right, get to a high level in the languages, you want to practice, and your practice has to be principled, following the principles of language learning, right? The second most important factor when, in achieving your language goal and becoming fluent or mastering a language is that it takes time to master to learn a language, right? If you if you want to go beyond just saying some basic stuff, you want to speak comfortably, uh, to, 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 to like to a high level. Well, this is going to take time, right? It's not an immediate thing, right? You don't just become fluent in a language in two days or a week or a month. Not really. It takes it takes time to become uh, to to become fluent or to speak a language well, right? And so basically, in order to achieve your goal in language learning in order to become fluent to master the language or to get to a high level then what you really need to do is to apply principled practice over a long period of time that means you want to practice the right way over a long period of time but therein lies the problem right it's uh, it's most people who start learning a language quit quit how do i know this because a language is challenging people usually quit challenging things this is just how we work right uh Usually, here's, 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 here's what's going to happen, right? If you start a language, what, what's going to happen to most people? You probably, it's probably happened to you already. You pick up a language, you want to learn Chinese, you get super excited. Oh, wow, 
right? And then maybe for the first week or two weeks, you're super excited about Chinese. And then eventually you realize Chinese is hard. I have to learn the tones. Maybe I have to learn how to write the characters. I'm having a difficult time expressing myself. I'm turning on, I don't know, the radio, the TV, and I can't understand anything. You get hit by all these challenges and you're like, oh, holy fuck, man. I'm not going to be able to do this. This is too hard. Right? This is too hard. And so you quit. Right? So this, this happens to many people in many activities, not just language learning. Right? So the difficulty is in putting in this principled practice over a long period of time. That is not easy to do. Right? If you're trying to be like fluent in a language, attain mastery, that means you're going to have to, like you want to speak to the level of like a native, that will take at least one year, more than one year. How do you get yourself to practice every single day, day after day, day after day for a year or years? How do you do that? Right? That's the question. It's not easy. The typical tendency is to start and then quit. So this is really the meat of this video. That's what we're talking about here. Right? How, how do you get yourself to do, to practice? consistently over a long period of time because that's what's necessary in order to master a language right? to speak it well at a high level okay a level higher than just um what a level that's we're talking about a level that's higher than just uh, telling people hello my name is so and so and i'm this this i'm this age how are you what is your family those are basic conversations to do that you could probably do that in a week or two weeks but if you want to get to a high level, it's going to take time, months, years even, all right? So let's get into this now. Um, there are basically three forms of practice, three types of practice, right, th 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 that one can perform, right? And we're going to go into them uh, specifically just to see. The first type of practice is what is called repulsive practice. Repulsive practice is the sort of practice where... Uh, the practice that is, it has to be, it's sufficiently painful that you don't want to do it. Right? A very like extreme example to just clarify this is, let's say I decided to set up a practice session for you and I tell you, hey, you know what? Uh, you and I, uh, I'm, I'm setting up a practice session and you're going to run non-stop for a week. Right? Now this is very hard to do, right? So what's going to happen? Obviously, immediately you, do, you don't want to do this practice. Why? It's too hard. You're repelled by the practice. You don't feel like doing it. Maybe when you go to sleep and you wake up in the morning, you're not going to, uh, the whole night you're not going to be able to sleep because you think about, oh my God, tomorrow's practice. I'm going to have to run for a week non-stop. Right? It just becomes too hard and what's going to happen is you find yourself so repelled by the practice that most likely you're not going to do it. This is what we call repulsive practice, right? This is the sort of practice which you don't want to do. What I chose is an extreme example. In reality, there are levels of repulsiveness. Certain practices like Let's say you decide you want to learn a language and you decide you're going to study tomorrow for 22 hours, the language for 22 hours. Right? This is very, uh, what, the, 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 this, is, this is an extreme, you'll be extremely repelled from this kind of practice because it's hard to practice for 22 hours. If you decided to practice for 12, you're also going to be repelled by the practice, but not as much as 24, because 24 is much more, right? And even 6, if you're just beginning, 6 hours, 4 hours, 3 hours is still a lot for you, right? So... Basically, how do you know if you're doing repulsive practice? You know you're doing repulsive practice in a language when you find yourself resisting. When it comes time to learn the language, when it comes time to practice the language, you don't want to do it. You're finding excuses not to do it. If you experience any resistance to doing practice, that's evidence that you're performing repulsive practice. Right? Now, let's look at this practice carefully, right? Because, again, it's very advocated in society. Our society is filled with great giants, you know, like uh, David Goggins, the great basketball player, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. There's a lot of successful, high-driven business people and people in sports, you know, who tell us to push through the pain. You have to be tough. And literally, these people, we admire them. Like Kobe Bryant, one of the things that's admiring, we admire about him is the fact that he was able to push through so many painful practices. Right. We admire him and people like him right? because they were able to push through repulsive practice. Right? You wake up in the morning, you know you have to do all this long practice, it's really difficult and it's uncomfortable, but you push yourself through it. There is something respectable about that. And the respectable thing is that it takes the mental toughness it takes right, in order to push yourself to continue to do something that you don't want to do day after day, month after month, year after year. That is not easy. 
there's something remarkable about it on the level of mental, the kind of mental toughness necessary to do it, right? And this leads me to the first point when it comes to repulsive practice. Be repulsive practice is, by its very nature, because it, you don't want to do it, because it is so hard, naturally you're experiencing a lot of resistance to it. Naturally, the harder it is, the more resistance you experience. And because you're experiencing resistance, in order for you to do repulsive practice, you're going to have to have a lot of mental toughness, right? You're going to, have, you're going to need to have mental toughness. You're going to have to force yourself. It requires force. You're going to have to force yourself to practice, right? If you decide that you're going to study, learn uh, German or whatever your language is for, I don't know what, 12 hours tomorrow, right? Naturally, you're going to feel resistance to this. Right? And in, in order to get yourself to actually practice for 12 hours or 6 hours, whatever the amount is that repels you, you're going to have to really push yourself, force yourself to, to do it. Right? So that's the first element of uh, repulsive practice, is that it requires mental toughness. Right? So, now the thing is, look, most people are not mentally tough. Most of the people are not mentally tough. That's just a fact of things. How do we know that most people are not mentally tough? The way we know is that because, is because we admire people who are mentally tough. If we admire people who are mentally tough, that is actually evidence that mentally tough people are rare. That means that statistically speaking, you are not mentally tough. It means that if I gave you a task, to, like if, if I set up, let's say, for an entire, for two months, 12 hour practices in a language, after a while you're going to quit. Most people are going to quit under those conditions. This is the first reason why you don't want to do uh, repulsive practice. You don't want to set up practice sessions that you're resisting to go to because most likely you're going to quit the practice. You might push yourself through it for a week and then you're going to quit. And now we have a problem because we said in order, in order, to, in order to master a language, in order to achieve your language learning goals, Unless you have very basic goals. In order, to, in order to master a language, you're going to need to put in principled practice. That is the right kind of practice that follows the principles of language learning. You're going to have to do the practice over a long period of time. Okay? Now, if you do... But if the practice is so repulsive, repulsive to you that you quit after a couple of days or weeks, then how are you going to be able to put in the practice necessary to attain mastery? Right? So it becomes self-defeating. This is the first reason why it's actually not a good idea for you to do repulsive practice. Because you're going to quit and you're not really going to get to the level of mastery that you're looking for. Right? But even if you're mentally tough, and if you're the rare, one of the rare people who are mentally tough, there are still good reasons why you shouldn't do repulsive practice. There's actually better forms of practice, but I'm getting ahead of myself, right? So, now... Now that I just said that, okay, you, you're, you're not going to be able to do mental practice very likely, you're not going to be able to do it, maybe you're feeling a bit of shame, you know, you're feeling a bit of shame, like, wow, I'm, I'm just weak, I'm not mentally tough, I can't get myself to push through the pain and get it done and go hour after hour, day after day, month after month, year after year, why can't I do that, right? You might feel ashamed that you can't do that. And you really shouldn't be ashamed of not being able to do this repulsive practice this practice that repels you. It's not shameful not to do it or to choose not to do it. It's actually not weak. And here's why you shouldn't feel ashamed of not choosing or being able to do repulsive practice, right? The first reason why you shouldn't be, asha you shouldn't be ashamed of not being able to put in repulsive practice is that your goal is not to become mentally tough. Your goal is to become fluent in the language, to master the language, to be able to speak it comfortably. But your goal is not mental toughness. Mental toughness is just a means to an end, but it's not the goal, right? So it's not intelligent. It's actually kind of, it's, it's really not very intelligent for you to pick a mode of practice. You set up practice sessions in a language that are too hard for you, that you're resisting and are repelling you. And then maybe when you set them up, you feel good because, wow, I've set up a really tough schedule, you know, six hours of German every day, right? Now... It's not very smart because if you're going to quit after a week or two weeks, right, then you're not going to achieve your goal. It's, the shameful thing is not to achieve your goal because you created a practice system that you cannot sustain. Right? Actually, you should feel proud of yourself in realizing that, hey, look, 
this kind of repulsive practice, this repulse, this practice where I have to force myself every day to, to keep practicing is, is not so, is, is just, uh, it's, it's, it's not going to lead me to my goal. Recognizing that is actually intelligence, right? And it's not, it's something to be proud of. You figured out that a certain type of practice, you're not going to sustain it. The question now becomes to figure out, hey, what, what kind of practice can I sustain? That's the first reason why you shouldn't really be ashamed that you're not able to push yourself every day working hours and hours and hours and hours on the language, right? Pushing through the pain like a tough guy, right? Uh, the, the, the reason we said you shouldn't be ashamed is just, look, your goal is not to become tough. Your goal is to learn the language. If something is not take, if, if, if something is not helping you to get to mastering the language, you should, be, you should quickly get rid of it. There's nothing shameful about getting rid of something that's not working for you. Getting rid of repulsive practices that you cannot sustain. Nothing shameful about that. And the second thing is this. Repulsive practice is stupid. Right. Now, this might be hard for you to believe. Let's go step by step into this. Just look at how we be, uh, nature, how we are in nature. Anything, right? Somebody, th the master, the master is the person who's able to achieve great things with the least amount of effort. For example, there's a, arguably the greatest player ever to touch a soccer, a soccer if you're American, the rest of the world football, right? The, the, the greatest footballer on the planet arguably is Lionel Messi, right? Now, if you watch Messi play, you're going to notice something amazing. Lionel Messi is going to dribble through defenders. Right? He, these are world-class defenders. He's going to dribble through, dribble through multiple world-class defenders, make shots that look totally impossible. And the most amazing thing is he does all of this with, with ease. When you look at him, it's like he's not struggling. It's, he's, just, he's just moving fluidly. This is like he's doing it. He makes it look so easy, so simple. And this is one of the reasons why you admire a player like Lionel Messi. Because he's able to do mind-boggling stuff. Stuff that is so difficult. He's able to achieve amazing results by applying the least amount of effort. This is a sign of an intelligent player. Right? It's, it's a sign that he has mastered. Right? It's a sign that he has mastered football. Right? Because only a master can really accomplish great results by applying the least amount of effort. That's efficiency. That's intelligence, right? Just I guess to really, to really, to, to really make this sink in. I want to help you really get this. Is imagine two guys, right? Let's just say Jerome and Tyrone, right? Jerome and Tyrone. These guys just uh, they decide to go to a gym, right? They're, they're both weightlifters. They're about the same physical size. None is bigger than the other, right? So let's say Jerome comes first, right? Jerome comes in and. He's trying to lift 100 kilograms, gets on the bench and lifts 100 kilos, right? And let's say as he's lifting it, he's really sweating, man. He's like, ah, making noises, pushing. You can see him sweating, man. He's like, ah, his hands are shaking. He's like, man, like he finally lifts. He finally lifts the goddamn 100 kilos. But you can see, oh my God, man. He took, he took all his energy. And by the time, actually, they have to remove it from him because he can't control the goddamn bar. Right. And eventually, look, once the, 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 once the 100 kilo weight has been removed from him and taken away from him, he's like, you can see that he's totally exhausted. He's totally exhausted. Man. He's just lost energy totally. Right. And then that was Jerome. Right. Then Tyrone comes in, his friend, and he gets the 100 kilos and just lifts it without just easily lifts it. Right. He, he's not sweating. He's not punting. He's not struggling. He lifts it and he puts it back on the whatever, the holder for the weight. Now, if I ask you the question, between the two, Jerome and Tyrone, Jerome was the struggling guy and Tyrone was the guy who lifted the weight with ease. Which of them, who of them is a better lifter? The answer is obvious, right? It's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be Tyrone. Because, why? Because Tyrone was able to lift this heavy 100 kilogram weight with the least amount of effort. Right. Obviously, he understands, he has a better understanding of weightlifting than someone who has to struggle. Whenever someone has to struggle to do something, that's a sign that they don't really understand how things work. Anybody who's able to do amazing things without struggling, that's the person who really understands how things, works. things work. This, this principle applies even in technology. The technologies we admire 
are the ones that are able to do produce the greatest amount of the results results with the least amount of effort right compared to phones i mean back in the day there used to be a phone called a blackberry right the blackberry <laughs> if you <laughs> If you're, if you're a little older, you'll know it. If you're a teenager, maybe you might not know what a BlackBerry is. I don't know. Anyways, a BlackBerry was a type of phone. And basically, this BlackBerry had a lot of buttons. Right? And at the time, it was a good phone. And then out came a phone like the iPhone. A phone the iPhone replaced all those many batteries. Maybe there were 15 or more than 15 batteries. Uh, sorry, uh, buttons right on the on the on the on the BlackBerry, but the iPhone came out, and the iPhone has like maybe just four buttons, right? So, and the iPhone is clearly a superior product because the iPhone can do way more than the BlackBerry was able to do, and the iPhone does it with using the less amount of buttons, and it just it's it's just more efficient, and we admire the iPhone because it's simpler, it does much, but. It does it simply. It does much with little amount of effort, right? So, whenever w w being able to do something with ease is a sign of intelligence. Being able doing having to struggle to do something is a sign of lack of mastery, and is also evidence of stupidity. It doesn't mean you're a stupid person. It just means uh, stupidity in the sense that you don't know how things work. Right. This is the sense in which I tell you that repulsive practice is stupid. Why? Because you're having to push yourself every single day. You have to, like, look, you've made a practice that's 10 hours long and you can't even sleep because you're so scared of tomorrow. You're resisting tomorrow. You, you, you have to, like, really force yourself to practice. This is not something to actually admire. When someone has to force themselves every single day to practice, that's a sign that they haven't mastered. They don't really understand how to set up practices correctly. They're not setting up intelligent practices. Right? Repulsive practices are stupid. This is another reason why you should not feel so ashamed if you can't do repulsive practice because it's actually not intelligent practice. There are much better ways of practicing. There are methods that can get you to do the practice necessary to until you reach a level of mastery in the language without having to force yourself every single day to practice and that's what we're really going to be talking about today but that being said you know repulsive practice does it have advantages absolutely one of the big advantages of repulsive practice the kind of practice that you're resisting the advantage of repulsive practice is that it allows you to get a huge amount of results within a small period of time right so for example if I told you that you had to get fluent in a language in one week, now is it possible? I have no idea if you can really get fluent in a language in one week, right? But look, the, the mode of practice that will give you the best likelihood of becoming fluent in one week is going to be repulsive practice, right? It's natural. Repulsive practice is harder, you're working longer hours, of course you're going to get more results, provided that you're practicing, your, your practice follows the principles of, of language learning, you're doing principled practice. Of course, right? So it's going to give you, that's the attraction of it. It gives you a lot of results in a short period of time, right? Now, this kind of practice is okay, right? Repulsive practice is okay if you're, go if you're only going to do it for a short period of time. If, if I'm going to do repulsive practice only for a week, it's okay. I can push myself, like when you have a deadline. You can push yourself to do what it takes, right, uh, for, for a couple of days. It's just a problem if it's your long-term strategy, right? There's something really problematic about trying to achieve things quickly. Right? Because that kind of thinking is suited for short-term things. Certain things cannot be achieved quickly. You're not going to learn a language like a native within one week. You're not going to do it within five months. It's going to take longer, a year or more. It takes time to learn a language. Right? So repulsive practice, this mentality of I'm going to push myself super hard, I'm going to force myself, I'm going to strain my body, because I need to get this now, 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 right? This is, uh, this is, unless you, it's, it's really not a good attitude to have. The attitude of a master is that things take time and you have to think long term. Not set up practices that are so painful that you're not going to be able to keep them up. Or if you keep them up, you're going to end up damaging your health in order to get, uh, to get your goal, right? But that's an advantage. One advantage is of, of uh, repulsive practices that it will give you results quickly okay so that's an advantage 
The second advantage of repulsive practice is that it creates a tough mind. And this is kind of clear, right? The greater the difficulty, the more the mind has to adapt in order to handle that difficulty. This is just for survival purposes, right? A good example is, look, if I'm sitting on a sofa, eating like a, eating like a, a bag with a bag of potato chips, eating some potato chips, I'm, I'm chilling on the couch and watching TV, I don't need any mental toughness at all. Why? Because there's, not, there's no challenge, there's no struggle, it's easy, I'm just watching TV and chilling on the couch. But if a war broke out, right, or let's say armed robbers broke into my house with guns, oh shit, right? Now my mind automatically will become tougher. Right? Because, I mean, I'm under difficult conditions. The mind, naturally you'll find yourself being more observant because you're facing difficulty. The greater the difficulty, the more the mind has to adapt. The tougher it gets. Maybe before the arms robber broke into my house, I might have thought to myself, oh my God, man. Like, uh, maybe before I, I used to be bothered by things like, oh man, my TV is blue, I really wish it was red. I'm really pissed off that my, my TV is blue. It should really be red. But when armed robbers break into my house and, and I'm under difficulty, that is not a problem. The color of the TV is irrelevant. That's a minor issue compared to the issue of protecting my life. Basically, the mind has gotten tougher. It has developed a higher tolerance. Most things that were problems are no longer problems. Most things that were uncomfortable are no longer uncomfortable because now the mind has to rise to a higher level in order to survive. So this is a bit of an extreme example, but it illustrates the point, right? If, if suddenly you decide that you're going to work, you're going to like learn a language for what, uh, 18 hours a day, right? and you keep pushing yourself to learn a language 18 hours a day, your mind is going to have to adapt in order to allow you to do that, right? Uh, it's it's, it's, it's going to like, uh, basically what's going to happen is that you're going to have to just, you're going to have to push yourself to do it, to do the 18 hours. And so your mind has to change in order to allow you to do that. And obviously if you keep putting in this kind of practice every single day of a long period of time, repulsive practice, your mind will naturally become sharper and tougher. So that's an advantage, right? The greater the difficulty, the tougher the mind has to become in order to meet that difficulty. Right? This, this is just natural. So this, this is another advantage of repulsive practice, right? In fact, there's people like I think, there's a guy called David Goggins. Check him out if uh, you've never checked him out before. And uh, David Goggins is basically a guy who um, achieves remarkable things, right? Unbelievable, mind-boggling things like running apparently on broken legs, right? And obviously, he does those kinds of stuff to toughen his mind. So that's an advantage of repulsive practice, right? But like I said before, it's not the best practice in order to attain mastery in, in, in a language. Your goal is not mental toughness. And by the way, I'm going to show you a system, of, a way of practicing that will get you to master in a language. And it's not, it's not going to sacrifice mental toughness. It will still make you mentally tough, right? Okay, anyways. All right. So we've gone through repulsive practice. Uh, we said, okay, it's the kind of practice that you don't want to do because it's hard. You're resisting it. You have to push yourself to do it. And we said in general, it's, it's kind of stupid practice. And most of most people anyway quit, right? And, and, and don't get very far in, in, in this practice, right? Um, so, but I mentioned before that we have three forms of practice. There's repulsive practice. The second form of practice is called comfortable practice. Now, comfortable practice is a sort of practice where you experience no resistance at all, right? Uh, it's just, it's, you experience no resistance at all, resistance at all, and it's so comfortable for you, right? You're doing stuff that's just in your comfort zone, right? So, for example, if you're a fluent English speaker, speaking English is not a challenge for you. It's normal. It's easy for you to speak English, right? That is why, for example, you might have noticed, if, if you're listening to this, likely you are a fluent English speaker. So, you might have noticed that because you speak English so well, maybe this entire year you've spoken to people in English. And if we look at January until now, your level in English has not really improved, although you've been speaking a lot of English. And the reason is that you've been, your speaking practice has been comfortable. You've been speaking, uh, it's not hard for you to speak. You've not been challenging yourself as an English speaker, right? Because it's, the practice has just been so comfortable, right? So this, this kind of, that would be an example, right? Like what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, speaking with people in English or in, in your own a language you're already fluent in, typically that is just comfortable practice, right? 
and look if you look at it in terms of video games like if you if you play a video game where you where you're super comfortable there are no challenges you know how to do everything that is also we'd call that comfortable practice in the video game right so comfortable practice is comfortable of course you don't have to resist yourself you don't have to apply any energy at all to get yourself to do it because it's so easy there's no resistance at all in repulsive practice man you like you have to force yourself to do it with this one no force is required so you might be tempted to think wow this is an intelligent form of practice then because we said before achieving applying less energy is a sign of intelligence an intelligent uh, person a master well it's only true if you're also achieving right you're also achieving uh, remarkable results if you achieve remarkable results with the least amount of effort yes you're more intelligent and you're, um, you've, you've mastered the stuff more than somebody who's applying a lot of intelligence. But comfortable practice is not really intelligent. Why? Because it doesn't produce any results. Right? If you practice within your comfort zone and you don't push yourself, you're not going to get any results. And in fact, what's going to happen is, you'll, paradoxically, comfortable practice will become repulsive. It, it can become repulsive. Because if something is so easy for you, it's so boring. And then you have to also force yourself to do it because it's so boring, right? So if, for example, I don't know, like in the case of language learning, let's say, uh, let's say that you know, the you know enough of the language to be able to talk about basic things like yourself and your family. If you keep talking about yourself and your family in the language, it will be comfortable for you, but eventually it will become boring. And soon you'll start dreading having to talk about yourself and your family again. I'm bored. I'm tired of this stuff. So now the comfortable practice has become repulsive because it's so boring, right? So obviously comfortable practice is not what you want. It's also stupid practice. It's stupid because sure you don't expend any energy, but it does not produce results. All right. So this begs the question, okay, I can't do practices that are repulsive, right? Practices that I have, I don't, I can't, if I force myself to do something, if I force myself to practice, that's not good. It means my practices are stupid. They were not set up well. And you're saying, hey, you in Moja, you're saying also, if a, if a practice is comfortable and you don't have to push yourself to do it, then that practice is also stupid. Now, now, now you might be like, Moja, tell me, what's an intelligent practice? Like, what else is there? Well, there is something, there's something better. It's not, it's not that you have two options. Either you have to force yourself or apply no energy. There's a third one. Something could be so interesting to you that you have to force yourself not to do it. It takes energy not to do it. That's what we call addiction, addictive practice. And that's really what I want to introduce you to today, addictive practice. And a good way to see what addictive practice is, imagine a freaking addict. Imagine someone who's addicted to cocaine. A cocaine addict loves cocaine so freaking much. He loves cocaine so much that you'd have to literally force him, pull him away, drag him in order to get him not to take cocaine. He'll do anything for cocaine. Like he'll sell his house, sell his children, whatever the heck it takes. In, oh, wait, I need to drink a bit here. So the cocaine addict will do whatever it takes, whatever it takes uh, in order to take cocaine because he's addicted to cocaine. Cocaine is so pleasurable to him that you'd have to stop him from taking it. This is where you want to get at in, in language learning. You want to get to the point, you want to have set up practice sessions for, your, for language learning. You want to set up the sort of practices where you have to force yourself not to practice because the practices are so enjoyable, right? And this is not the same as comfortable practice because you said if you're feeling too comfortable, you get bored. This is not addictive. You start resisting practice, right? So obviously this addictive practice is very powerful, right? Because you literally have to put in no effort to practice. And because you're addicted to practice, of course you're going to show up day after day, month after month, year after year, in order to attain mastery, right? If it's in a language, you're gonna you're gonna do the time, you're gonna practice, you're gonna put in the work because it's addictive to you, right? It's like, look, it's 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 it's, it's pretty much a guarantee that a cocaine addict is gonna take cocaine for the entire year, 
Why? Because he's an addict. Right? Same. If you're addicted to language learning, we don't have to worry about you. We know that you're going to practice every day for the entire year or even two years. Right? Because you're just, right? Because you're an addict, right? So this addict, addictive practice is obviously what you want, right? And the question is, look, well, is it even possible? Is it possible for practice to be addictive? How do I make practice addictive? Right? That might be the question, right? Okay, here's how you make practice addictive. I'm going to give you two, uh, two, 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 two methods, uh, two, two, two tips on how to make practice addictive. The first one is practice within your sweet spot. Right? So a practice, a good practice, should not be too hard. It should not be too easy. Right? If it's too hard, you're going to be overwhelmed and repelled. If it's too easy, you're going to get bored. You need to find the middle path, the sweet spot. That is, a, that is a spot where something is not too hard, not too easy. And you actually, you're going to struggle to figure out the challenge, but eventually you're going to figure it out. Right? And this is how you should set up your language learning activities. Right? For example, look, if you're, you're learning a language and you want to improve your listening comprehension, right? it's not a smart idea, for example, to, like, let's say it's your first day, you've never spoken German before, it's your first day, and then you decide to play, like, uh, you decide to listen to a podcast where people are talking about the meaning of life, philosophy. You're not going to understand a goddamn thing, right? That is too hard, too overwhelming. As a result, you won't, you'll learn very little, if anything. And pretty soon you'll start avoiding listening because it, the material is too complicated, right? But if the material is too easy for you, let's say you're at an intermediate level and you're listening to the language, but you're listening to stuff that at the beginner level, like, I don't know, my name is so-and-so. If you already know how to say that, that, that stuff is going to be boring and it's going to lead to no improvement. What you want to do, for example, if you're listening to the language, you want to listen... You want to listen within your sweet spot. You want to listen to material that's not too easy, not too hard. It's in the middle. It's in the middle there. And so you have to struggle a bit to understand, but eventually you're able to understand it. Right? So, well, how do you make sure that you're within this sweet spot? That's easy, right? So, when you're practicing the language, whatever you're doing, if you're learning grammar or speaking, whatever the language activity you're doing within the practice session, if it becomes, if you feel that it's becoming hard and frustrating, make it easier. If you feel that it's becoming too easy, make it harder. And what you'll notice is that if so long as you do this, you're going to remain in your sweet spot. And actually your mind enjoys overcoming challenges. Right? So it's like, look, video games, you know, video games actually obey this principle of addictive practice. If, you, if, you have, if, you, if you've ever played a video game, you'll start the game and the first level is not too easy, but it's not too hard. Right? So you're able, it keeps you engaged. Because it's like you have challenges, you're getting most of it right, but certain parts you're not getting right. So you push yourself. Right? And then you're able to figure out level one. After you figure out level one, the game doesn't keep you at level one. Because level one has become easy. It's your comfort zone. The game is now going to take you to level two. But level 2 is not so hard. It's a little harder than level 1. And now again on level 2 you're excited. You know, you're trying to figure shit out. You're like, wow, okay. How do I solve, like, you want to solve the problems on that level. Right? And the problems are not too hard, not too easy. And after a while you find yourself at level 50, right? You're freaking addicted to the game. Because you've been playing, the game is set up so that you're playing within your sweet spot. You want to do the same thing with language. Practice things within your sweet spot. Anything you practice, if you're speaking, if you're reading in the language, if you're writing in the language, if you're listening in the language, whatever you're doing in the language, make sure that it's within your sweet spot. Not too hard, not too easy, okay? So that's the first step to make practice addictive. The second thing to make practice addictive is lower your standards. Now this seems like a bad word, bad sentence. You shouldn't say this. That's so weak and lazy, Moja. What do you mean, lower your standards? Shouldn't I be raising my standards? Shouldn't I be reaching to the moon? Right? Why shouldn't I be reaching to the stars? Why are you telling me to freaking lower my standards? That's so weak and wrong. Hey, hear me out. Let's, uh, let's, let, let, let's look at this, right? I'm not saying lower your standards as in lower your goals in the language. No. Right? If you're, like, for, for example, look. My goal is to speak a language... When I learn languages, I want to learn the language to a native-like level. 
I wanna right now it's German. I wanna learn German to the level of a native, to reach native like fluency. Right? It does that sound like a low standard to you? It's not a low standard. We're not talking about the goal. Set high goals. Aim for the aim for the fucking stars. But when it comes to practice, we are saying lower your standards. What do I mean? For example, if my standard of practice is so high that I don't want to show up to practice, then I'm never gonna hit the the stars, right? I'm not gonna do it, do the practice for a long time, right? Unlikely. Some people will, but most people won't, right? So, for example, it's your first day. You've never spoken a word of German before. It's your first day, and you're not used to learning languages, right? It's not smart for you, for example, to say because you're ambitious and you wanna learn German to a native like level. It's not smart for you to say, oh my goodness, so because I want to be, I want to learn, at a, I want to become a native, I want to speak like a German native, what I'm going to do is, hey, uh, my, 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 my first practice tomorrow, I'm going to practice for six hours because I need to put in a lot of work. Right? That, that's, that's, that's most likely not smart because from your very first day of practice, you're already resisting practice. Or maybe the first day you do it and then the, the second day you don't want to do it. Right? So instead what you want to do on the first day is lower your standards. Do something ridiculously crazy, man. Like, you could even say, look, tomorrow I'm going to practice for only two minutes. Now, this seems kind of foolish and lazy, like two minutes. What can you learn in two minutes? That's not the point. The point is that if you, there is no resistance to practicing for two minutes. You'll practice for two minutes. But, but notice what's going to happen. After a while, you're going to want to practice more. You'll practice ten minutes. At some point, you'll feel like practicing an hour. So long as, like, you're also practicing within the sweet spot, you're going to find that over time you want to practice more. Five hours, six hours. After a while, we have to stop you from practicing because you really enjoy practicing so much, right? But you start by lowering the bar. And this is always a process, right? Sometimes you don't know what the bar should be. Like, you come, you show up to practice today, and the practice was kind of hard. Your language learning practice was kind of hard. Maybe you listened to a text that was, you read a text in the language that was too hard for you. So tomorrow, if you're going to be doing reading again, make, look for a text that's easier, right? And, and then, then, then there's no resistance. Now you have to lower your standards a bit. And then maybe after a week you get excited and you pick a text that is really hard, but it becomes too hard, so you lower your standards a bit. You keep adapting, but over time, what you're going to notice is that eventually you're going to start practicing at a very high level. At a, let's say let's say that at the, on the very first day, practicing for four hours was too much for you. After a while of like low, like basically lowering the bar a bit so that you can keep practicing and practicing in your sweet spot, sweet spot. What you're going to notice is that after a while, you'll be able to practice for four hours something that before was repulsive. Now it will be totally normal because you've grown within that time. You've become capable of practicing for four hours and you're comfortable with it, and you can maybe even practice more hours than that, right? So that's what we're saying, lower your standards. Don't put the standards of practice so high that you don't want to put in the practice. That is stupid, because eventually you're going to quit and you're not going right, to, you're not, you're not going to achieve, uh, you're not going to achieve your goals of fluency, mastery, or, what, or whatever your goal is in, uh, in, in the language, right? So, now, and I mean, like, basically, when it comes to this, I do have something that, I'm, that I apply myself, right? Is, so, so here's what I did when, when it comes to m many of my practices. Here's what I do. Let's say I've decided tomorrow I'm going to learn, I don't know, grammar for two hours, right? What I tell myself is, all I got to do is make progress tomorrow. If at any point during tomorrow's practice, I don't feel like practicing, I'll just do, make a bit of progress and I can stop. I can stop whatever I want. I just have to put in, I just have to do something within that session. I need to put in a bit of progress. So that's what I tell myself. If I find myself resisting tomorrow's practice, I just say, hey, look, all I gotta do is make progress tomorrow. I know my timetable says I should practice grammar for two hours. But if I went there and practiced for one minute and I don't feel like practicing anymore, I can stop. Notice what this does. It creates no pressure for me. And guess what happened? You'd think that, wow, that means that pretty much I'm only going to be practicing one minute, right, because I have that option. That's not what happened, right? What, pretty much there was no day when I, very rare for me to practice for such a short period of time. 
Most of the practices I practice the full amount of time and usually want to practice more than that. And on some days I'm not feeling it, I practice like halfway. But notice that I'm always making progress. And guess what's happening also? I find myself naturally the desire to improve and make the practice harder is coming in. So I'm practicing harder, I'm practicing longer, and I'm not experiencing any pressure to go and practice. This is really the holy grail, right? But okay, so you like this addictive practice, but you're still feeling that maybe addictive practice is for people who have no discipline and people who are lazy. So here's the natural question. So is, is addictive practice for lazy and weak-willed people? Right, that's a natural question to ask. Maybe it's like for people with no mental toughness. Uh, that is not true, actually. Um, what addictive practice does is that it takes the long view. You start by, like, it, addictive practice, what it does is it builds your mental toughness. Right. That's why I was telling you before. Like, in repulsive practice, we're saying, if, if you're doing practice, if you're forcing yourself to practice when you don't feel like, you're becoming mentally tough. That's true. Right? But, even if you do addictive practice, basically what addictive practice does, remember what we said about the sweet spot? You're facing challenges and you're meeting them and the challenges are getting stronger and stronger. It's like you start at level one, then you go to level two, level three, level four difficulty. Right? And as you, for every level that you go up, you become better capable of handling that level. That's what addictive practice does. It builds your mental toughness gradually. So every, every day that you show up to practice, you're, men, you're tougher, you're tougher mentally. You're better, you're capable of handling uh, more and more demanding stuff. You're capable of working longer and harder. You, your body and mind are developing the capacity to handle bigger and bigger challenges. So addictive practice is, in, is brilliant in that way, is that you do not resist practice and your capacity to handle difficulty, your mental toughness is going up. That's the power of it, right? And actually, I'd have to tell you, like... Um, there's a guy who like does a lot of repulsive practice. His name is David Goggins. Really amazing guy. Has achieved a lot of stuff. And uh, basically, one of the things he did was like he did really extremely repulsive practice that he broke down his body at some point, right? He broke down his body, right? Like at some point he was just sick. The body couldn't move or anything because he was doing really hard practice every day, pushing himself to the limit, right? And this guy is obviously amazing. He did great stuff. And he wrote a book right, called Can't Hurt Me. I recommend it. Basically one of the best books I ever read. Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Yeah, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Right? David Goggins, David, and then Goggins, Goggins is G-O-G-G-I-N-S. David Goggins. Right? And great book, right? And in the book he gives you exercises on how to develop mental toughness, how to become tough. And basically... He does not recommend that you start off doing things that are so hard that you don't want to get started. Even he did not recommend that, right? He, that's how he got tough, but he realized that you don't have to break down your body in order to become mentally tough. No, it's not necessary, right? So what he would say is, start by performing, an, start by doing, what he said is, basically start by doing something that you can do and then continue to gradually increase the difficulty. He also recommended that method. Because, and addictive practices designed that way. It will build your mental toughness also. It's not weak. It's not weak, uh, it's not weak that you're doing a practice that way you don't have to push yourself every single day. It's actually building your strength, all right? So look, I've, I've, I've spoken about this stuff. I've, I've, I've actually written down in detail all the ideas that I've shared in this video, right? And if you go to the description of the video, I've written down in detail, right? All these ideas that I've just shared to you now, in case you want to have them in written form, right? Um, and look, uh, like I said, right, I, I, as, as promised, I delivered useful information right through to the end, right? And, I, and I'm going to continue to do that. I keep making videos every Saturday, sorry, every Monday I publish a video at 8 a.m. Central African time. So if you want to receive these videos, make sure to like this video. Yeah? I want you to hit the subscribe button. And there's a bell, so hit the bell notification. This will notify you whenever I publish a new video. Look, thank you very much for watching this video, and I hope to catch you in the next one. Bye.